and welcome to chapter 10. In chapter 10, we're going to discuss classes, which is the introduction of object-oriented programming. Um, we'll be able to take code and split them into objects and be able to use those objects similar to how we did in lists and dictionaries, but the objects will be classes themselves. It's really an exciting topic and I hope that you guys enjoy it. Let's get started. Before we really get into classes, I just want to make sure that you understand all the concepts that we've taught you so far. So in this course, up to this point, up to chapter 10, we have covered terminal input and output, being able to get stuff from the user and add and put stuff out to the terminal so the user can read it. We've done conditionals with if, then, or else. We've done our looping, either with for or while loops. We've done functionality and modules using parameters and arguments. We've done our file I.O. to be able to read from a file and write to a file. We've done our lists and tuples, our string slicing and manipulating, and the last chapter was on dictionaries and sets. So these are all concepts you should be comfortable with. If any of these are still struggling with you, please take the time to go back and rewatch the videos for those chapters. Um, make sure you maybe do a couple extra projects in those concepts, because it's really important that you understand all of these concepts before we move forward. When we talk about programming, we generally refer to one of two different types of programming. The first is the programming we've been doing up to this point, which is procedural. Usually it has one or more procedures or functions, usually uses modules, and it's linear. It's the idea that it starts from the top and it kind of sequentially goes down to the bottom, and everything is kind of in order. So you can just look at the code and see how it flows from one point to the next to the next, even if we go into a function, Go into the function, linearly go down the function, and then come back out of the function. Everything's in a nice line. The next type of program that we talk about is object-oriented, or OOP, object-oriented programming. And in object-oriented programming, we create objects, which are generally a noun or a thing, a person, place, or thing type object. And those objects have attributes or descriptions, ways of describing them, things about them that, keep, that make them the unique. The difference between someone with blonde hair and someone with brown hair, um, a house at one address or another. These are attributes or descriptions of the object to help you understand the object, a blue car and a red car. Um, we also have methods. Objects can perform methods or verbs, actions. So the ob just the way the car can drive forward and drive back, um, our objects have the ability to perform methods. Those methods are generally a function of functionality of some type, but they're an action that the object will do. So when we think of methods in an object-oriented programming, we're thinking of actions. There are two different ways that we describe a project as object-oriented. The first is the concept of encapsulation. Encapsulation is a way of taking all of the objects and all of the data and all of the code having to do with a certain object and keeping it separate, keeping it together as its own little project, kind of like a little black box. This is all of the code that goes with a certain object, and it's kind of hidden from the user. The user can access these, this code by saying, I want to run this method or run that method, but they don't need to see the actual code. They can just create a concept of the object and use it, kind of the way that we did with lists, where we just created a list and there were some methods we could use with the list. We could create a set and we could add things to the set, remove things from the set. These were all methods that were on the set itself that were created. We didn't have to write them. We didn't have to, to know what the actual code said. We simply knew that there was a function name and we understood what it did because of the object itself. When we had a set or a list, we understood the concept of adding something to it or removing something because those are pretty common ob or verbs that you would be doing with a set. When we're creating our object, we want to think the same way with our verbs or our methods being something that is really obvious what it does. The other concept we do with object-oriented programming is object reusability. We like the idea that this object can be used by multiple programs. If you can create an object that is an object to be used across three or four programs, you only have to build it once. You can build that object similar to the way that sets and lists and dictionaries were built as objects. You can use that through multiple things. All you have to do is import it the same way we imported turtle or imported random. Random is just an object that we've created. So with object reusability, when we create an object, we are able to take that object into the future when we write new code and be able to use that code in other programs. 
We can also define our methods as either being public or private. Private methods are methods that are only used within our code base. They are not being used outside by other classes, whereas our public ones are available. So when we differentiate between the methods that our classes are able to use, we want to understand whether they are public or private. And if they're public, that means other classes can access them when they are being referenced. But private ones, those are kind of internal and they don't need to be seen. When we're talking about a class, there are methods and data attributes for a specific object. But when we talk about the class, the code that we're going to write for our class is just a blueprint. It's able to be instantiated into multiple instances, but it's the descriptive blueprint of all the stuff that we want the class to be able to do. The same way that a blueprint for a house is not an actual house, but you use the blueprint to be able to create multiple houses, multiple instances of the blueprint. So when we're creating our class, we think of it as a specific object um, that we're going to create an instance of this object. Now, again, I always like to think of them as nouns because it's generally a thing. Um, when we use our class, we create a class definition. So we use the word class and we'll talk about the actual syntax in a sentence second. But it'll be a set of statements that's used to describe all of those data attributes and methods. One of the things that's very important with our class is the concept of a constructor. When we create our class for the first time, we are going to always use a constructor that says, I'm going to set all the default values. You may have heard me use the word constructor. I've been intentionally adding it to my lectures so that the word gets a little more comfortable. When we created a list the first time, we used a constructor. When we used a set the first time, we used SET, the set word, and then parentheses, and we used it as a constructor. So we said, we're going to create a new object that is a, that is a set, and these are the parameters that it's going to take. When we create our object, we do the same thing, and we create a constructor in our class definition. So let's look at some actual code, and this might make it a little easier for you to see. In this case, we are creating a class for a coin. So a coin, a heads or tails coin, that you flip to be able to determine if it's heads or tails. Our coin itself, when we use it, in this case we're going to also use random, so we've imported random. Um, but we're going to create a class called a coin. This is our, our object definition um, header, where we're going to say co class coin, and we're going to put a, a colon because we're starting the class. Remember, everything after the class is going to be indented. In this code, I have both my main function and my class function in the same code. Sometimes you like to keep your class functionality in a separate file. Sometimes you want to have it in the same file with your main. You can do either, and it'll depend on the assignment, how you feel about it, if you want to separate out your main into its own file. But in this case, the main is in the same file because it's a pretty small class. This class of a coin has a constructor, which is an initializer. We like the word init. So in this case, the um, code to initialize our coin is our definition, like a function, and we use the two underscores of init and then two more underscores. These are telling us that um, this is a function that is the constructor, and Python knows that. Every time it sees underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, it knows that that's the constructor for your class. That's, that's predefined in the language. When we do that, we also pass it a parameter, and in this case, we call the parameter self. When you're using your class, each instance of the class has its own set of parameters, its own set of attributes. So again, my car might have a color and a make and a model. These would be attributes that would be associated with it. In this case, we need to be able to tell the constructor code what object we're referring to. And in this case, we're referring to ourself, which is the object itself. We're going to use this in some of our other code to be able to access the object inside of our code if we wanted to access some of those attributes. In this case, you always have to include the self parameter. If you've used other languages like C Sharp, C++, Java, this is similar to a this operator, referring to the object that you've instantiated yourself. So this is the object instance, not the blueprint, the actual house. Um, so we are going to set the attribute of what side is up. And in this case, we are going to set the side up attribute of self equal to heads, because we're going to set it to heads just to default, which is fine. 
So to do that, the same way that you would reference a single attribute of any object, we are going to give the object um, variable, which in this case is self. Remember, we referenced ourself. We're going to do a dot and then the, vari the attribute name, which in this case is side up, because we're going to use that throughout to figure out what side is up. So we're going to do the side up attribute, and we're going to set that equal to the string of heads. We could choose to make this a Boolean value, heads or tails, zero or one, something like that. But for all intents and purposes, this is pretty easy. So we're just going to put it as heads or tails. Then we are going to have a method called toss, because we're going to toss our coin. And we want to be able to have the coin do an action. So this action is going to allow us to flip the coin and randomly assign either heads or tails. Now you've already used the random operator before and you've done an if statement, so this should be pretty common. The if statement, we're going to do our random. If the random between 0 and 1 is 0, we are going to set that side up to heads. If the random is 1, we are going to set the side up to tails. So the method of toss is simply going to assign that heads up attribute to either be heads or tails. We also have a third method. So we have our constructor method, our initialize. We have our toss method. And then our last method is our get side up method. This is going to return what side do I have up for my object. The same way in some of our other objects, we've asked for the length of our list. We could do list.length to get its attribute. In this case, we're going to use get side up to find out what the side up value is. We like to keep our what we call getters and setters separate from our object itself. In this case, the object is, is or the attribute itself is side up, but we don't really want the user to be accessing side up directly because sometimes we like to check the code, make sure they have the right information. Maybe we might want to format the code. So instead of just letting them access that value directly, we're going to get a getter, which is our get side up. Again, all three of these methods take that self attribute, the self argument, because we have to tell the code who the object is, what the instance is, so that it can keep track of those attributes. As you see, when we create our coin in our main function, so now this is how I've explained all of the coin, let's talk about main. So in our main function, I'm going to create a new instance of a coin. When you create a new instance of a class, most of the time, your constructor, you're going to use the capital name of your constructor. Your, your classes should always be capitalized um, in regular sentence case, not all caps, but single cap and all lowercase. And we always do an open and close parenthesis, or we can add attributes. We'll talk about those in a second. So in this case, I am creating a variable called my coin, and I am setting it equal to a new instance of a coin. So I'm going to say my coin equals, and I'm going to use the capital C coin, which is the object name, with open and close parentheses. And what that's going to do is it's going to run that initializer code, create the object, and set it side up to heads, because that was the default we put in the initializer. Then I'm going to print out what is the side up. So I'm going to say this side is up, and I'm going to reference my variable, my coin, and I'm going to say get side up, because I want to call that method to get which side is up. And you can see the top choice of this side up was heads. Then I'm going to run through a for loop, and I'm going to toss my coin and then print out what side is up. I'm going to do it 10 times. So I have my for loop, which you should be comfortable with, and then I'm going to print tossing the coin, just to let the user know that's what's going on. I'm going to call the toss method. Now you'll notice these methods, I didn't need to put the object in the parentheses, the same way you would with a normal function, because with Python, when you have a class, it will always take the class object as its first parameter. So in this case, it takes the my coin object as its first parameter. And um, it'll call the toss method multiple times. Each time it will print out whether or not you had heads up or heads down. So this is a pretty simple little method on coin toss. I actually included this code in D2L if you wanted to look at it on your own. The important things to remember with this is that self parameter, you have to include it. Again, it's like the this object if you know other languages. Um, and methods are always called by using the dot and then the method name. If your method doesn't include any other arguments other than self, you can just do open and close parenthesis. We'll talk about methods that have more parameters or more arguments in a second. In the example I just gave you, all of the methods were all public. All of the attributes were public. Side up could have been changed by the code. I could have gone directly into my main code and written my coin dot side up and set it to heads. It's called cheating, but you could have done it. 
um, because those objects were all public, which means you were allowed to change the attribute from outside of the class definition. If you want to make those methods private, which will limit the control that you have, it'll make it so that all of those methods or all of those attributes can only be used within the class itself. We can put two underscores before the variable name or before the method name. With the exception of our initialize, which is always used as a constructor, you can say self dot underscore underscore side up. And that will tell the compiler that this is a private attribute and outside people should not be able to access it. So when you have a private attribute, you put the two underscores and that tells everybody along the way, this is private, you should not be using these, you should be using the ones that don't have underscores because those are public. So public methods and attributes are accessible to other code, whereas private methods and attributes should only be called or modified within your class description, within your class definition. You should never be modifying or calling private methods from outside of your class. This is a way that we use to hide our attributes. If you have local attributes that you want to use, but you don't want the whole world to be able to see them, you, you really like to control what the outside world can do with your class. Sometimes you have helper methods, sometimes you have helper attributes that are in there, but you don't really want everyone to be able to see and, and use those. So we make them private and we make it so that everybody else can't see them. One of my favorite methods in a class is the string method. There's a lot of different ways to do this in different languages as well, but in Python, it's two underscores and an str and then two more underscores, similar to our initialize, but instead of init, we're going to do string. And what this does is allow you to write your code so that I can print out my object, and this is the code that will come out with when I'm trying to print my object. If you try to print your object directly, and it doesn't have a string method, it will print an address. It won't print anything that makes any sense to you. But if I create a string, a string method on my object, I can just call print on my object and it will print whatever I tell that string method to print. So in this example, I've created a bank account. So I have a deposit and a withdraw and a, and a get balance. And then I have a printout string, what is the current balance? And that printout says, quote, the savings account balance is, and then has a dollar sign, and it has it all nicely formatted for me. I only have to write this one time, and then every time I want to print out my balance, as you can see from the code over on the right hand side, I could just say print savings and it will allow me to just print out that whole the saving balance is. So all of the code that's in yellow is showing you how I can just print that and it'll print that nicely formatted. I only had to write the code once and it prints it every time I need it. So this is kind of a really convenient function to be able to print your object exactly the way you want it to look. So I've talked about the word instance a few times. If you're having a hard time visualizing the instance, the instance is the actual, in, the actual object that is created. And you can create multiple instances. Just like I can have two cars or three cars, I can have three instances of a coin. I can have three instances of a house. Boy, wouldn't that be nice. Um, so you can create multiple instances of this of the object. You already wrote your code once, that was the blueprint, and you can say coin one equals my coin, coin two equals coin, coin three equals coin. And by doing this, I have each instance, and each instance has its own attributes. So if I flip the coin that's coin one, it doesn't flip the coin for coin two and three, it only flips the coin for coin one. So it only sets that heads up for the coin that is being flipped directly. That's why we reference that self, because we need to be able to know which instance to refer to with that instance. So, since each instance has its own set of data attributes, changing one's instance doesn't change the other's attributes. So changing one instance's attribute does not change the other ones. These are called instance attributes, and they're attributes that are associated with the instance itself, not the class as a whole. So it's not like all the all the tail all the coins have the same heads up. Each one has its own attribute. To access those attributes, we use accessors or getters. We also use mutators or setters to change that value. So we can write a method called set balance that will allow us to change the balance of my um, 
my account from the previous example directly if I wanted to say set balance. So if I wanted to say set my balance to $100, if I wanted to say with my coin, set my, my heads up, I could have a setter that was a mutator. Remember the word mutate means to change. So my setter will change your value. Your accessor will allow you to access or get the value. So keeping track of your accessors and mutators or your setters and getters. You can pass parameters. Um, you can, I'm sorry, you can pass instances as parameters to methods and functions. In this example, I have simply created a function called toss in my main, my main code that takes a parameter of a coin. So that argument of the coin goes in and I can toss the coin. If I wanted to do something else like print, I am tossing the coin when I, when I do this, I can do that. I can just say toss the coin and it'll print it out and say toss, this side is up. So I can write my methods in such a way that I take my instances of my object as parameters, as arguments. I'd like you to take a few minutes to go and do the project on page 522. This is a kind of long one, this is 522 to 532, and this is creating a contact class. It has a constructor and it has getters and setters, and then it takes those objects and stores them in a dictionary. Then it creates a menu to allow you to add, change, or delete those, and it saves it all in a file. There's a lot of stuff going on in this project, and it's a really good project to kind of get a reminder of file I.O., being able to use the pickle stuff that we know from last chapter to serialize our objects and save them as an object in our, in our file. We want to create an application to allow us to make choices, be able to use menu choices, and use our dictionary to store those. So this is kind of a lot of things all in one, but the code is in your book. So it's kind of a good example for you to practice with of learning all of the little syntax clues here. But the important part from this one is creating your contact class and being able to modify, use that class in a main function. So go have fun with this one, and when you're ready, come on back. When we're working with classes, it's useful to have a couple of suggestions on techniques. How do you create your class? Um, how do you decide what are the attributes? Or what are the methods that you want for that class? One of the things that we like to use is called a UML or a Unified Modeling Language document, which is a, which is a little graph or it's a little picture um, up in the top corner where we use the name of the class and then we separate out our public versus our private attributes and our public versus our private methods. And these allow us to just kind of visualize before we get started writing any code, all of the methods and all of the attributes that we're going to want to add to our class. By doing this early and just sketching them out, you can just grab a piece of paper and a pen and start scribbling. Um, figure out what your, what your class is going to look like before you start coding. Because a lot of time you're going to start coding your class and you're going to start writing stuff and going, hey, should I add a method for that? Gosh, I forgot to add this attribute. But if you think about it early and write it down, it should help. When you are trying to come up with your class, finding your classes, you write out the description of your problem, the whole problem. Then you're going to figure out what are the nouns in my problem. Each one of those could be a class. Not all of them are, but some of them could be. So some of your nouns are going to be the same thing. I could say car and I could say vehicle. Well, those are kind of the same thing. Um, so I only need one class for those. I don't need two. Some of them just aren't necessary. I could have something like, you know, how many tires? Well, they all kind of have four. So let's just go with, you know, is that really a necessary piece of information? Um, some represent instances. So I could have Mazda, or I could have Chevy, or I could have, you know, a Buick. And these are kind of more instances of my class, little instances, the, the individual entities themselves rather than the class as a whole. I might want to have a make or a model, but the individual ones are probably just instances. And then some of them may be variables or attributes, but not classes themselves. So individual little things, like if I want to talk about a windshield or a window, how many windows, well, should I make window a class? Well, no, it's kind of part of the other one. It's more of an attribute than of a class itself. So then you're going to think about all of the different nouns and figure out what your classes are. Once you figure out your classes, figure out what words you would use to describe your object. Color, size, amount, style, things like this, because all of these are potential data fields or attributes. And it's good to run through them all to figure out what type of attributes you think would go with this class. 
And finally, what actions do the class does the class do? So a car can accelerate and it can brake and it can stop and it can go. Um, things that the car can do. So it can turn left, it can turn right, it can go backwards. So these are potential methods or verbs that the, act, that the class can do. And this gives you an idea as to what verbs or what methods you're going to create for your class. The example that we have here is a UML diagram for a cell phone. And in this cell phone, we have a manufacturer, a model, and a retail price, because those are all kind of attributes that go along with it. And then we have some getters and setters that go with it. You can see our setters for each of those values and our getters for each of those values. And then, of course, we have our initializer. We have those separated in our UML, where the ones on the top are your private and the ones on the bottom are your public. So this is just kind of a nice little visual that you want to have for your object so that you know where you're going before you start coding. I always like to throw this one in there in case anybody in the room has ever played D&D before. D&D character classes, um, D&D is a game if you don't know what it is. Um, it's a role playing game. It's been around for long enough that I played it when I was your age. Um, but D&D is one of those where you create a new character. Your characters have attributes the same way that our object classes do. Our name, our class, our strength, our dexterity, our, our hit points. These are all attributes that go along with your character. Your character then has methods like attack or cast spell or check skill. These are methods or that are functions that you can attach to your class. So if I were to create a class for my D&D character class, I could add all of these attributes and more to my attribute list and then I can create all of these methods and be able to say I'm going to create a new character and these are the attributes that go along with him and these are the methods that he can perform. And this is a way of taking that object of that character and being able to do things with it. All right, so your homework for this chapter is only one project. Um, I wanted to kind of make it a little simple, but I do want you to, um, to really think about it. So you're going to obviously do the chapter 10 quiz, which is already in D2L. And this is exercise two from the book, but um, I want you to add a little bit more to it. So you're going to create a class for a car and it's going to have some attributes and it's going to have some methods. It's also going to have a constructor. You're going to create a program that initializes the car object and calls the accelerate and brake methods a few times and being able to print out as well. I'd also really like it if you would please create a UML diagram for this car. I'm only going to say it in the video, so that's going to be something to let me know whether you watched the video or not. Because if you didn't watch the video, it isn't written anywhere else. So in your homework, I expect a UML diagram for your car class. If you have not created one, you'll lose points over that. So just a heads up. So for those of you who actually watch the videos, thank you. And this is your way of getting points for it. And if you don't watch the videos, that's why you missed it. So. This is your homework assignment for chapter 10. I hope you learn a lot about classes because classes, if you intend to do anything else in programming, are really important. Object-oriented programming is pretty common. And um, I hope you guys have a fabulous week. Call me if you need anything.